Father, we come before you this evening. We thank you for your word. Once again, this new generation on the edge of going into what was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham sojourning throughout that land, yet he himself taking possession of almost nothing aside from buying a burial ground for his wife. And so, Lord, this evening we're in our own journey of faith where we have been promised absolutely stunning things in your presence. There's a joy that overflows. There'll be no more end of time or sickness, death, sin, curse. Just pure fellowship. Pure water of life. Twelve fruits on the tree of life. And the overwhelming glow and glory of your presence. To be in the very place with our creator where he abides, to have direct communication, to see you, to hear you, the tone, the intonation of the answers that come to what's been laid on our hearts to ask. That's what you have waiting for us. And so as we watch the children of Israel finally begin to take possession of what had been promised for so long to them, may it stir our hearts, Lord, that one day perhaps without much warning, we'll suddenly find ourselves in your presence. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So Lord, we are comforted that your, the day approaches and you've called us to be part of it. So open your word afresh, we pray to our hearts this evening, and may it change how we live, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the encouragement came to him, the end of chapter 7 there, verse 21, Thou shalt not be affrighted at them, these nations they will go against. For the Lord thy God is among you, he's a mighty, a mighty God and terrible or awesome. The Lord thy God will put out these nations before thee little by little, that thou mayest not consume them at once, lest the beast of the field increase upon thee, and that's how he works in refining us as well. But the Lord thy God shall deliver them unto thee and shall destroy them with a mighty destruction until they be destroyed. And he shall deliver their kings into thine hand and thou shalt destroy their name from under heaven. There shall no man be able to stand before thee until thou hast destroyed them. The graven images of their gods shall you burn with fire. You shall not desire the silver or the gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein, for it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thine house. Boy, is that an interesting thought. Lest thou be a cursed thing like it, but thou shalt surely or shalt utterly detest it and shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Do not pick up the habits, the worship, and the ways of the ungodly, because it will only cause you harm. So chapter 8, all the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, again Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And thou shalt remember all the ways, or the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee, to prove thee, and to know what was in thine heart. So God gives them his commandments to Make them a separate people, but also as you go through and understand many of them, in many ways also to protect them and to bless them. There's a reason why God encourages us, you know, for example, for a man and a woman, when they have this desire, they find that, you know, she's cute, he's cute, whatever, they start talking. Wow, they're not only cute, but they actually put sentences together. That's interesting. And they get more entrenched with each other. And pretty soon they start thinking of, gee, wouldn't it be great to get married? And the way God designed it is that that introduction there, that, that initial relationship is one that is meant to be of learning the heart and learning the thoughts and learning the, the sense of where that person's coming from and hopefully also learning where are they with God and their own walk with him. And as that curiosity continues to build, well, let's, I mean, I'll be honest, there should be some kind of desire or else why would you want to get married, right? Something, something has to make you guys get out of your comfort zone, go across the room and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. Wow. But God has a gift for the wedding night. And that's where the two become one. 
all the way up into that wedding night, the focus of what God intended for a man and for a woman is to get to know each other as individuals, as friends, as brothers and sisters in Christ, and ultimately heading in towards husband and wife lovers. When you get that out of order, you begin to blind yourself to what are you really getting? So for example, when we deal with you know, premarital couples, we, we have our premarital class, we exhort them, listen, if you're sexually involved with your boyfriend, girlfriend, or now your fiance, you know, we, we have warned people, we, we won't talk about a date. In six months, you gotta stop this behavior, get right with God, come back in six months, we'll talk about a wedding date. The first year that we did that, three of those engagements, once we kept seeing this trend, like, you know what, that's it, you six months, go honor the Lord, you come back, like, yes, we've been honoring God, great, let's talk about a date. Three of the engagements that year, once we said, sorry, we can't help you if this is what you're doing, failed. Once the sex was no longer what united them, they found they really didn't have the friendship or perhaps even the same sort of outlook of things for serving the Lord that they thought they might have had. And so once you got rid of the distraction of, of sexual behavior and sexual sin, you had to get down to the heart, the friendship, the attitudes. And, and may I perhaps suggest you paid better attention once you got rid of the distraction. And so in that case where God tells you that your wedding night is where he wants you to enjoy the two becoming one, and I have to also say, maybe you didn't get you know, saved until after you got married, and so you guys didn't have any of that. You just did whatever the world was doing, and you know, that, you know, anybody's in Christ, you became a new creature. All things are new. But for those who have the benefit of knowing Jesus while single and pursuing someone who also loves Jesus while single, it's getting serious. He has a, a firing order for a reason, and that's because he wants you to build what has the lasting value of the understanding of one another, the caring for one another, the love for one another, the friendship, and then you add on to that whole foundation that's built, the wedding night where the two become one. And so the reason God gave those instructions is because it was ultimately to bless you, that you would have a better understanding of who is this man I'm asking to be my covering, or who is this woman I'm asking to trust me, who is this one I'm asking to forsake all others, to cleave to me alone. And so it opens the door for the real foundation to be laid as opposed to being distracted with being caught up in sexual sin, which brings its own baggage with it even into the marriage. And so there, in this case, these commandments that he's giving to Israel are for their own good, to protect them and to bless them. And so, for example, if you and your boyfriend or girlfriend, and then eventually fiance, and then eventually husband or wife, if you've done it God's way, you don't have to worry about unwed pregnancies. You don't have to worry about assuming you've done it God's way and all that. You don't have to worry about picking up STDs. You don't have to worry about a whole host of things that that are not a problem because if you've done it God's way, then, then the marriage bed in many ways is simply blessed. And so this idea of, well, God's holding out. No, God's actually waiting to give to that husband and that wife the ultimate gift of the two becoming one and that deeper love that exists when there is that trust, that foundation, that friendship that makes all the rest of it so much more rich. And you may say, well, I thought we're here for Deuteronomy. We are. But as someone who came out of the very sexually promiscuous past, who, you know, high school, college, uh, even into grad school, fooling around with a lot of people, you know, I can tell you that there was such an emptiness that eventually I came to this point of going, who did I ever really care about? And that, that lady had already become a believer. I told her she was a nun. She should join a convent because she kept telling me I needed to get right with Jesus and what we were doing was wrong. And didn't want, it took me two years to catch up. You know, she was so awesome, I married that girl. But first I had to get saved. And then when we did finally get engaged, I became a believer in October. We got engaged in November. All her friends are like, who's this guy? She said, don't worry, I'm marrying my dirt. He is my past. But we honored God in our engagement. And he really made all things new. And this time we built the main thing on the main thing, which was our friendship and the love of Christ. And so I can tell you that I have been in the lost, chasing the flesh, chasing the whirlwind world. And after surrendering to Jesus and saying, you're in charge, I'm not, we did it his way for engagement. And so when I sit with couples saying, well, you don't understand how difficult it is. <laughs> yes, I do. I came from being lost to having to, okay, you're in charge. And 
And you know what? God helped us. So these commandments that he's giving to them are to separate them from the world around them and ultimately to bless them far much more than the world around them has ever experienced. And so when God says he doesn't want you involved with something, it's not because he's the great thou shalt not and he doesn't know how to have fun and everything else. I mean, look, look at the leaves turning gold and red and all the colors. You think he doesn't like to have fun? Look at the creation. Look at the duck-billed platypus. Do you think he doesn't have fun? He's like, I'm going to put something together to screw the evolutionists. Here, just put that thing out. Good, figure that one out, right? He's, he's got all kinds of stuff he's got in store. Let's put a few planets in our own solar system rotating backwards to mess with Big Bang. You want Big Bang? That's fine. Your telescopes will tell you you're wrong. Six out of 63 moons going backwards. He likes to have fun. He just does it in his own subtle way. So all the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do, that you may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness, one to humble thee. See, humility is a natural outshoot or byproduct of coming to the fear of God. When you realize that there is a creator, he said literally, let there be light. Light came into existence, energizing matter or whatever he did, and eventually makes it sun, moon, and stars. When he says, let the earth bring forth, and suddenly the earth is covered in vegetation, livestock, animals, the complexity of systems within systems within systems, and we're just talking about your body. Never mind the fact that there are plants and everything else around that you can consume to run the systems within the systems within the systems. When you see just the, the, the immensity of God and how he's created things, once you realize that there is a creator and he actually entered time and space, took on human flesh to die for his creation because he loves it that much, and that he knows your name, that should produce immediately a humility. You know, maybe you've met somebody quasi-famous, or at least, you know, kind of a big name in your neighborhood or whatever, and you actually get a text from them or a call, and you're like, oh, they're calling me, right? He's calling you. Think about it. So the first thing he did in bringing him into the wilderness was to humble them. He took them out of Egypt. He took them out of this land that had the Nile River and the overflowing and the seasons and the water and the food and the crops and the Egyptian technologies and all that. And he put them in the middle of nowhere where there are very few resources and he sustained them anyway. He humbled them. But see, humility is really one of the first steps to being teachable. If you're not humble, you're not teachable. And Proverbs has a lot to say about that. Rebuke a wise man, he'll thank you. Correct a wise man, he'll thank you. Rebuke a fool, and he'll come after you. Right? So humility in many ways, when you humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, as we often will sing, he'll lift you up. And so here with the children of Israel, one of the first things that had to happen is he needed to humble them, to show them that he's God and they're not, and to allow them even to suffer hunger. You know, there are times God will put you through leanness for his own purposes, ultimately to see that he'll sustain you. And I fed you with manna, so hold on, back verse 2, sorry, to humble thee, to prove thee, to test you, to know what was in your heart. Did God not know what's in their hearts? Who are the ones who didn't know what's in their hearts? Themselves. Why does God allow trials for you? He doesn't know, like, I wonder what he's going to do. He's revealing your heart to you. James, when he wrote to us, said, count it all joy when you enter or encounter various trials, right? And that's not the first thing in your mind when, you know, the, the tires blow up on your car, your refrigerator melts down, your hot water heater doesn't. And, uh, you know, and you're like, oh, great, right? And, and yet you'll find that those very trials of life are where you'll find God does supernatural things. And so when God brings a trial, it's because he's counted you worthy of being tested on the material. It means you're, you're ready to move up for lack of a better way to put it. Oh, I thought he hated me. No, he's graduating you. And he's giving you that trial. So here, he humbled them. He proved them. He tried them that they might know what was in their heart, basically. Whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. Verse 3, and he humbled thee, and he suffered thee to hunger. 
And when he did that, he did something supernatural. He fed thee with manna. What does manna mean? What is it? He fed you with what is it? Which thou knewest not. Nobody had seen it before. No earthly human. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make you to know. Hey, here's that third answer that Jesus used when he was tested. That he might make you to know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. You remember that first trial of Jesus when he had been fasting in the wilderness for 40 days. And the devil came to him and he said, Since or if you're the Son of God, command that this stone be made to bread. Now, if you've ever read that trial and you're like, oh, what's the big deal? Does Jesus have the ability to turn stone to bread? Well, he turned water to... Okay, good. But the, ta- the challenge is actually eating outside of the will of the Father. He was driven into the wilderness to fast. Adam and Eve were in an absolutely gorgeous garden. He's 40 days fasting in the wilderness. Adam and Eve were in a world that did not yet know the fall. He's born into a world that is gripped in the fall. It was actually a very big test. And so his answer was, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And they'll look back to this exodus where they had no resources to feed themselves, their wives, or their children. And yet God, in the middle of that wilderness, supernaturally found a way to take care of them. Moses is going to recount for us this evening as he interceded. He would spend 40 days and 40 nights with the Lord on Mount Sinai, neither eating nor drinking. He does it twice. You know, isn't that amazing? I'm going to get an angry email. Isn't that amazing? He didn't have his freeze-dried food with him up on that mountain. And yet God made a way for him. Well, now you're being reckless. Listen, there are going to be times where God's going to put you somewhere where unless he comes through, you're not going to make it. Is your faith in a supply chain? Is your faith in the government showing up in the midst of a crisis? I was just checking. Or is your faith in God who can even raise the dead? How many remember reading The Heavenly Man, Brother Young? We handed that book out. I believe he said, according to his testimony, I can't verify it, but I don't see the reason for him to lie. He went some 70 days fasting in prison, refusing to eat. God can sustain us even in the midst of absolute chaos. How big is your God? So sometimes he puts us in circumstances there's nowhere else to go but up and look to him. He humbled them. He suffered them to hunger. He fed them with manna, supernaturally providing for them, which they knew not, neither did their fathers know, verse 3, that he might make them to know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth Man live. We've had missionaries that they've been out. There there is no gas left in the car. It is dangerous for them to stop, and yet God gets them through three more towns on E. We've seen God do things you never would have even thought to have asked in prayer. He is the one who sustains us, ultimately. Your raiment, verse 4, your clothes wax not old upon thee. And since they didn't have social media or catalogs, they didn't know they were out of style. Your raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell, swell the idea or even be blistered, and you try sandals on hot sand. He even took care of their feet, perhaps even their cardio, so that they didn't retain fluid. He did this for 40 years. God sustained them. You know, you could see them as he's saying this to them. They're like, wow, son of a gun, he's right. Look at that. Still hung in there. This is before they had tough skinned jeans, and some of you aren't old enough to even know about those. Or Garanimals, remember that? Well, was that a flashback? Oh, I can separate the room. Watch this Pinky Tuscadero. <laughs> Ask them later. Your raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. You shall also consider in your heart that as a man chasteneth his son, So the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Now, please understand, if you grew up with an abusive father, 
Somebody over the top, I'm truly sorry because you've, you've missed in many ways a nature and an attribute of God. But if you grew up with a father who would say when, they, when your kid came out, I'm done with school, you're done with your school. I grew up with that. Now, my kids are like, I know, I know, I'm done with my homework, you know, but they thank me after interviews. And my dad did the same, right? You try to correct them to help them to do better. Your father in heaven, he corrected you like a man chastens his son, so the Lord thy God chastened thee. Why? To make them better. In fact, to make them all they're capable of. That's a beautiful thing about a wonderful godly wife. She can see in you guys things you cannot see in yourself. That's a good wife. Conversely, same thing, ladies. A godly husband can see in the wife things she cannot see in herself. And rather than compete with it, be threatened by it, seeks to provide a place in their marriage where that can bloom. But that takes getting to know each other first. Therefore, thou shalt keep, verse 6, the commandments of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to fear him, to honor him, the idea to realize he is the ultimate, the almighty, and that ought to get some respect, to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land. What he promised was awesome. And if you ever get a chance to go to Israel, go. It is amazing in this state the size of New Jersey. You've got these incredible canyons and valleys and deserts. And then you've got Mount Hermon with snow on it. You go into the area of Dan and you literally have the headwaters. And then you've got the Dead Sea where you float. I mean, it's just absolutely stunning. The Mediterranean, the mountains of Judah, it's just incredible. He gave you a good land. A land of brooks of water, fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills. We go into this forest in the area of Dan, and we actually sit on this little corner of the path, and there's a you know, little stock rail or split rail fence, and right at the base of the fence, just bubbling out of the ground, is one of the headwaters of the Jordan. It literally is just coming out of the ground. Just like we know one day there'll be a river that comes out of the very foundation of the temple, there and flows down and heals the Dead Sea, Ezekiel 47. You can literally go sit there and stare at the bricks of water, the fountains that spring out of the valleys and the hills. A land of wheat, by the way, these are the seven naturally occurring foodstuffs that are there in Israel. Wheat, barley, vines, that would be grapes, fig trees, pomegranates, a land of olive, olive trees, and honey, that's the date palm where you get date honey and you also get little honey from bees, but most likely the date palm is what's being described. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness, when they were right with God, and even now, they have amazing fresh fruit. No GMOs, all locally grown. I mean, it's just people get over and they're like, why didn't you tell us about the food? We didn't come for the food. Food's the benefit. Like, well, everybody's like, I thought I'd lose weight on this trip. <laughs> yeah, no, you won't. You shall eat bread without scarceness. You shall not lack anything. A land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. There are iron and copper that have been found in the hills there south of the Dead Sea. They, this is all found there. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments in his statutes, which I command thee this day. See, the problem is when things get good, we find ourselves often taking less time to talk to Jesus. When things are bad, we find ourselves constantly talking to Jesus. I won't ask you if you've ever had that experience, but when you're going through major problems, major upheaval, trials, job loss, whatever, you're talking all the time to Jesus. You don't even want to listen to anything on the radio. You just want to talk to God about what you need. But when things are good, if you're not careful, you slip. And so the next warning to them here is, beware the prosperity that will come with this land, that it doesn't pull you away. Lest when you have eaten, verse 12, and you are full, and you've built your goodly houses, and you dwelt therein, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up, and you forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You know, when Paul wrote to Timothy about the requirements for an elder, 1 Timothy 3, he goes through some of the different things, blameless beyond reproach, ruling his house well, some different issues. 
And then he puts an interesting phrase in, not a novice or neophyte or newly planted, lest he be puffed up and fall into the snare of the devil. What was the snare of the devil? God created him, he says in Ezekiel 28, perfect. Coverings were topaz, sardis, jasper, all these stones, pipes, timbrels, the anointed cherub who covers, was perfect in all his ways until iniquity was found in him. He was lifted up because of his beauty. Lucifer decided that the host of heaven ought to stop and it worship him instead of bringing it up to the Lord and that he deserved it because of something inherent within him. And so Paul writing to Timothy about elders said, not a new believer because it's too easy for them to easily get puffed up and think, well, I'm, you know, everything's going so well or people are coming or whatever it may be because I'm such, you know, I'm so spiritual, I'm such a great guy, not a neophyte. Lest that success puff them up and then they fall in the snare of the devil. So here the same thing. Be careful when God begins to bless you that your heart doesn't get lifted up and you find yourself slipping away from God. He goes on to it here in a minute and gives more on it. The one who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, verse 14, from the house of bondage, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein there were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, and he took care of them anyway, where there was no water, who brought forth water out of the rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, knew not that he might humble thee, that he might prove thee or test thee to do thee good at the latter end. It was all his training. Lest thou say in thy heart, my power, my might, my hand has gotten me this wealth. The reason I'm wealthy is not because of God. The reason I'm wealthy is because I'm so slick. That's the opposite of humility. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Now, some of you don't like that. I've got wealth because I put in long hours. I got wealth because I went to the right school. I got wealth because I interviewed with the right companies and then kept parlaying my way up to an even better company. I got wealth because of me, 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 mine, mine. You know, all he has to do is just say, stop breathing. Now you got nothing. Now you got probate for a will if you left it behind. And all that hard work goes to other people. God's the one who blesses you. God's the one who blesses you in your jobs. He's the one who's ultimately behind that. You get passed over for a promotion, there's a reason why God withheld it. Promotion doesn't come from the east, the west, or the south. Psalm 75, 6, and 7. God is the judge. He brings one up, and he brings another one down. He is in charge of that. Some of the most random chance events in your world may be exactly what God had to do for what he wanted to open up next to you to bless you and your family. And there's no way to explain it. There's no logic behind it. But all of a sudden, God just opens a door. You have a need. You're praying. You're asking God to help. And he does something you never could have mapped out if you had tried. It was him. So remember to thank him for what you have. I had a chance the other day. I was sitting outside. It was just beautiful. Late afternoon. Sun's coming down there. It's just, just amazing. You know, and a garage kitty's floating around, attacking and killing whatever she can get her hands on. Yet she's all love. I'm sitting there, and we've, we've got this old car our kids use. I have it out there at night. And I'm, I'm just sitting there smiling at it, like, man, thank you, God. This thing has survived three young drivers. You know, and it's still mostly undented. Yeah, it's getting pretty rusty. But I was, just, I was just smiling, like, you know, thank you, God, the tires aren't flat. He gives you everything. Don't forget to thank him. So remember, verse 18, the Lord your God, for it's he that giveth thee power to get wealth. That he may establish, you know, and Jesus said what? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. Matthew 6, fantastic chapter about priorities. He is the one that giveth thee power to get wealth. That he may establish his covenant which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. God's got a plan that he's doing. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows what he desires to do with you. And it shall be that if thou at all do at all forget the Lord thy God, verse 19... And walk after other gods and serve them 
and worship them. Moses says, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. It will be to your own harm that you do these things. And the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, um, as the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, verse 20, so shall you perish because you would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. And you know the history of Israel. Northern kingdom gets taken out by the Assyrians, southern kingdom by the Babylonians. And again, sadly, when he came to his own, they received him not. Finally, the Romans would come and judge them for missing the very Messiah himself. So chapter 9. Hear, O Israel, thou art to pass over Jordan this day, to go into the land, to go in to possess nations greater and mightier, than thyself, once again, it's God who's doing this, cities great and fenced up to heaven, a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, who thou knowest and of whom thou hast heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? In other words, the rumor's out. These guys are massive. You can't fight them. Who can stand before them? Understand, verse 3, therefore, this day that the Lord thy God, that the Lord thy God is he which goeth before thee, he goeth as a consuming fire. He shall destroy them. He, he'll use their hands to do it. But it's God ultimately delivering it. He shall destroy them. He shall bring them down before thy face. So shalt thou drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord hath said unto thee. He will show faithfully, taking care of you. So speak not in thine heart. <laughs> After all that the Lord thy God has, after that the Lord thy God has cast them out from before thee, saying, you know, for my righteousness. Where does everything start? Where does covetousness start? Where does the desire to get in an affair start? Evil thoughts. Blasphemies. Remember when Jesus said, it's not that which enters into a man and passes out that defiles him. It's what comes out of the mouth. For out of the mouth proceeds fornications, adulteries, evil desires, all these things that defile a man. The heart. And so, speak not in your heart after that the Lord your God has cast them out from before you. Verse 4, don't get prideful thinking you did it. Saying, for my righteousness hath the Lord brought me in to possess this land. Well, we're so holy. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord does drive them out before thee. It's not about your righteousness. It's just he's using you to drive them out. Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart, dost thou go to possess their land. But for the wickedness, verse 5, of these nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, and that he may perform the word which the Lord sware unto thy fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand, therefore, in other words, pay attention, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness. How many have caught that theme in the last few verses? They don't, okay, good. <laughs> and then he doubles down. He's not doing it because of your righteousness. For, oh, thou art a stiff-necked people. Can you imagine hearing that from God? I mean, seriously. He says to them, man, are you guys stiff-necked. Well, Pastor Chris, Pastor Chris, yeah. God knows the end from the beginning. That's what he tells us, and he proves it many, many times. Yeah. He knows they're stiff-necked. Yeah. Well, then why on earth did he pick them? Well, when Moses asked to see God's glory, if you remember, he said, the Lord, long-suffering, merciful, kind, forgiving iniquity. Right? He talked about God's patience, God's forgiveness, God's mercy, God's goodness to those who trust him. And after the Lord went past Moses and removed his hand and Moses saw the glory, the afterglory of God, then Moses began to entreat for the children of Israel and he said, listen, you're long-suffering and you're patient and you're merciful and you're kind and you forgive iniquity and, and have I got the perfect people for you down there right now, the golden calf? Now you have to be careful when you go to Israel. Because you look around and you're like, wow, 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 wow. It's not our job to remind them they're stiff-necked. Because even today you'll see a zeal without knowledge. There's a form of godliness 
but get to look behind the scenes and you'll find a lot of it's denying the power thereof. It's external. Yet the heart is anything but changed. See, that's the problem with being religious. You look spiritual, but you don't have eternal life. Gotta love having kids. That little guy's out there without a care in the world. No aches, no pains. Doesn't care if he whacks into a corner, table. I see his little head bouncing by the windows, going through the back there. I mean, he's just happy. I mean, how many of you skipped to the men's room? He's just out there bouncing around. Heaven's going to be awesome. But this idea, stiff-necked, God knew that about them. And while Israel has a history of not being faithful to him, when Pilate said, what should I do with him who's called the Christ? They said, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? John 19. We have no king but Caesar. Brought out the bowl. I wash my hands of this innocent man's blood. Matthew's account. Let his blood be upon us and our children. Roughly 32, 33 AD. When did the Romans sack it? 70. Basically, 40 years later. It fell on their children. It's amazing what was said and what happened. And yet rather than let that be the end of the story for the children of Israel, he brought them back like dried bones. Yes, they have some things I don't always agree with. But there's no other nation we've been told that God will bless those who bless them. And he'll curse those who curse them. The Romans curse them. Where are they? Gone. The Assyrians curse them. Where are they? Gone. Babylonians, where are they? Persians, let them return. You know of a country still known at times as Persia? Iran. Isn't that interesting? If nothing else, if the incoming administration seeks to help protect and bless Israel. That alone, and hear my words, that alone will bless this country. Let alone if they get spending under control. You're a stiff-necked people, but you're God's stiff-necked people. So if you're having a bad week with God and you feel like he's giving up on you, he won't. If he dealt with them and still showed them mercy and restored them, good news. He'll do it for you. Thou art a stiff-necked people. Verse 7, remember and forget not how thou provokest the Lord thy God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt. So you came to, I mean, think about it. He got them to Pihahirath, Nueva Beach. They're boxed in. The, the Egyptians are falling behind. They turn to Moses. They're like, what? No graves in Egypt? You're going to kill us here by the Red Sea? The whole way they've been, wah, wah. Anybody here ever do a long road trip with kids? He had the backseat syndrome. From the wilderness, from the day that thou didst depart out of the land of Egypt, you came into this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Also in Horeb, Sinai, you provoked the Lord to wrath so that the Lord was angry with you to have destroyed you. Just what did they do? Golden calf. When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I neither did eat bread nor drink water. Now, Jesus in the Judean wilderness does not tell us he did not drink water. And if you go through the Judean wilderness, you can find places of water. What's your clue? Because it's literally just wilderness rocks, dirt. What's your clue? Little scrub brush. That little scrub brush found water. Dig around that. But in Moses' case, he did not eat bread nor drink water. This is absolutely supernatural. And the Lord delivered, you know, I wonder if he thought, like, well, this is like day five. And... Nor drink water. 
the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And I just, for the record, remind you, he said in six days with his finger, he created the heavens and the earth. Six days. But you go home and work on that one. With the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you on the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. As the mountain was burning there and he was speaking to them. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days and 40 nights that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. And the Lord said unto me, Arise, get thee down quickly from hence, as back in chapter 32, if you remember, for thy people which, thou, which you, Moses, have brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten... They didn't even make it 40 full days from hearing you shall not have any other gods before me, shall not make any graven image, shall not bow down, bow down to them. They didn't even make it 40 days. That would be stiff-necked. Couldn't even make it 40 days without Moses around. They've made them a molten image. Verse 13, Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, twice in one chapter, behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Let me alone, that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven. And I will make of thee, Moses, a nation mightier and greater than they. I do wonder if Moses went, no, no, we can't do it, right? Just, that's a question I have. How long did it take for you to answer no? So I turned, and I came down from the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant, or tables of the covenant were my two hands. And I looked, and behold, you sinned against the Lord your God and had made you a molten calf. You had turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. Ten plagues, Red Sea, God providing for them, and they do this with the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud by day. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first, 40 days and 40 nights. I did neither eat bread nor drink water again because of all your sins which you sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wroth against you to destroy you. Think about that. He's up on Mount Sinai and God is ticked. What's that like? I mean, seriously, how many, how many of that boss, something's going wrong and he's, you know, storming all around, door shuts and, you know, Vesuvius is there in the corner office and I'm not going to go in to talk to him. No, you, no, I'm not going to go to uh, The office just, everybody's heads down behind their cubicle wall, hoping to miss the wrath of management. How many have been through that? None? Thank you. I worked with one guy who was an angry man. We were on a car ride one time. He would just, anyway. And he's going off, and I finally just said, listen, I don't understand it, man. For a guy who's so proud of his education, why is it you can't find a better way to articulate yourself? He apologized. You have to learn how to... <laughs> the Lord was very angry. His hot displeasure. Whereas the Lord was wroth against you. To destroy you. But the Lord hearkened to me at that time also. Here Moses interceding for the sins of the people. Moses told us later the Lord would raise up a prophet like unto himself, another intercessor to the nation. And this time it wouldn't be just a man like Moses. It would be God himself taking on human flesh. And he would do more than speak on our behalf to God. He would take our sins on himself and also the punishment they deserve on that cross die the death we deserve, and then rise again to prove it was accepted. Jesus did more than just say, hey, give him another chance. He said, take me. Take me. Let that soak down in your heart for a minute. Take me in exchange for her, for him. I'll pay for them. But you've done nothing wrong. I'll pay for them. If you really let that sink in, shouldn't that burn in your heart? I want to be a better man. I want to be a better woman. 
He did that for me. If you know he did that for you and you asked him to forgive you and be your Lord, how can you be comfortable continuing in things he had to pay for? That's part of what we're gonna get into with Ephesians. If you could be comfortable caught up in things you ought not to be, do you really understand him, what he did for you? He said, take me, take me on their behalf. And not just the people who might want to seek after God. He bore the sins of every human being so that he could be just in forgiving and dismissing your case. He is the justifier and he is also just. He is the justifier who died in your place and now God can be just in dismissing your case because he said, take me. Come ye, well, turn to Isaiah 12, Isaiah 48. Let me let him say it rather than me paraphrase it. 48, 16. Come ye near unto me. Hear ye this. <clears throat> I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there am I. And now the Lord God and his spirit have sent me, me, me who? They will look upon me whom they have pierced. He offered to come down for us. Because he knew we were stiff-necked. So Moses interceded. He fell down before the Lord. Verse 18. I fell down before the Lord at the first 40 days, 40 nights. I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which you sinned doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure wherewith the Lord was wroth against you to destroy you. But the Lord hearkened unto me at that time also. Jesus went even beyond that and paid it. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron to have destroyed him. <laughs> Remember him? I threw the gold in and poof, out popped his calf. Uh-huh. And I prayed for Aaron also the same time. I took your sin and the calf which you had made, and I burned it with fire and stamped it to the ground, very small, even until it was as small as dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. And at Terabah, that's the place of burning, where they complained against the God and murmured, and fire came down upon the outer parts of the, outer parts of the camp. And at Massa, that where they tempted the Lord there for water, that first time the rock was struck. Yekir broth hatava, that was the place where they complained about the food. God gave them quail, and they would die from their lust there. You provoked the Lord to wrath. Likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea, saying, go up and possess the land, they sent out the 12 spies. He brought them to the edge of the land, their parents. Possess the land which I have given you. Then you rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. You believed him not, nor hearkened to his voice. You have been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Now have fun taking the land. Moses signing off. He's, he's dropping some serious truth on them. You're about to be turned loose in the land. Learn something from the wilderness. You've been rebellious against the Lord from the day that I knew you. Thus I fell down before the Lord 40 days and 40 nights as I fell down at the first because the Lord had said he would destroy you. I prayed therefore unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, destroy not thy people and thine inheritance, this is his intercession back in chapter 32 of Exodus, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness, which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor to their wickedness, nor to their sin. Lest the land whence thou broughtest us out, say, the Egyptians say, you know, it's because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them. Because he hated them, he brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. Don't let them badmouth you, God. Yet they are thy people and thine inherit. They're not mine, they're yours. Which thou broughtest out of the land with a mighty power and by thy stretched out arm. Turn to Isaiah 42 for a minute. A thought occurs. How many of you remember when Jesus is there in the synagogue at Nazareth? They hand him the scroll of Isaiah. He opens it up and he reads from Isaiah 61. We're in 42, just so you don't get confused. 
But he reads Isaiah 61 about the spirit of the Lord being upon him. How many remember that one? Proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord to open the prison to those who are bound. The beautiful encouragement. And he stopped at a comma. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma. He rolled up the scroll and said, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your hearing. What he left out is, in the day of vengeance of our God. I get asked all the time, why doesn't God deal with these rogue nations? Why doesn't God deal with those who are human trafficking? Why doesn't God deal with those who've corrupted even his church or those who've abused people within his church? Why doesn't God deal with? And the answer is always the same. Once he starts dealing with it, it will not stop until it's done. He has been waiting. And you're thinking, well, that's weakness. Isaiah 42, 14. A long time I have holden my peace. By the way, look at the covenant, verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. And when I give you for a covenant to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord that is my name. My glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Before the former things are come to pass, new things do I declare. Before they spring up, I tell you of them. I'm bringing a covenant. A long time I have holden my peace. I have been still and have refrained myself as they spit in his face and they ripped out his beard and they covered his head and said, prophesy who hit you. A long time I have holden my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now the day of vengeance. Will I cry like a travailing woman, pain and agony of labor? I will destroy and devour. How long? At once. It is still the acceptable year of the Lord, but once he starts bringing his judgment, it will not stop. So don't mistake that for God's changed his mind or he endorses sin now or somehow he's slack concerning his judgment. Every day he waits is another chance for someone to find Christ, repent from their sin, and be spared the wrath that is to come. But when that day finally comes where he suddenly removes his church, he who restrains no longer restrains, then comes that lawless wicked one, that son of perdition. And the time that comes with that son of perdition will be so grievous that the Lord has to intervene because if the days weren't shortened, no flesh survives. The land, I fell down before the Lord, verse 25, 40 days, 40 nights. I fell down at the first because the Lord had said he would destroy you. I prayed therefore unto the Lord and I said, Lord God, destroy not thy people, thine inheritance, which thou hast redeemed through thy greatness. So I was brought forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember thy servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You promised. Look not unto the stubbornness of this people, nor to their wickedness, nor to their sin. Don't let the land whence thou broughtest them out say it's because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them. Because he hated them, he brought them out to slay them in the wilderness. Yet they are your people, your inheritance, which you brought out of the land by your mighty power, and by your stretched out arm. And at that time, the Lord said to me, cut out two new tables of stone. In other words, I've heard you. You know, tonight, if you don't know the Lord, if you ask his forgiveness right where you are, he'll answer you. He'll forgive your sin. He'll change your life. He already took your place. He gives you the very breath in your mouth but he will not force you to believe. He wants a real relationship with you. Like that early dating I talked about. It's caught your eye that God actually forgives sinners. It's caught your eye that he loves even the stiff-necked who surrender. It's caught your eye that he's not created you for destruction. He actually created you for fellowship. But now you've got to have the courage to come across the room and ask, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let him know you believe Jesus died for you. Ask him to come into your heart by faith and give you the Holy Spirit. Whether you're in the room, driving in your car, or sitting at home on a couch, 
If you will ask him to forgive your sin and be your savior, he will hear you and he will change you. What if he doesn't? He will. That's where faith comes in. How do I know? Go ahead and do it and you'll see. We're out of time. Let's stand. Let's pray. Lord, as this final recounting to these children of Israel is given before they lose Moses and they go in under Joshua. When we forget what you have done for us, it becomes very easy to take you for granted. But the more we remember how faithful you've been to us, it not only increases our gratitude, but it strengthens our faith. And so little wonder, Lord, how the world, the flesh, and the devil want us to take credit for or glory in things that were given to us by you. And so, Lord, tonight for your people, I pray that there would be again that work among us where rather than like Martha, so busy running to and fro, trying to do things for God, we're found to be more like her sister Mary, who was just so happy to sit at the feet of God and know his voice. So, Lord, strengthen your church. Refine them, I pray. And may we see more souls come to Jesus than any other time in the history of the church before you pull us out. Go with us this evening, Lord, and thank you for all the hands that served throughout the building to bless your people in your house. In Jesus' name, amen.